All right, welcome to the Inside the Boards Study Smarter podcast, question dissections for the USMLE, Comlex, and medical school. As you may have noticed, we kind of rebranded this podcast because we're adding both step one content and step two content to this channel. Nevertheless, it's high yield question dissections. So regardless of whatever level you are at in medical school, the uh, thought process and the how of these question breakdowns is relevant to you. Looking through our archives, we noticed that there was this immunology episode that for some reason we did not release in 2018. So I wanted to do that now and as well remind you that there is a 2017 immunology episode that we did with Ken Rosenthal, author of Rapid Review, Microbiology and Immunology. So you can check that out in the show notes and look for the companion presentation on our YouTube channel. Uh, that's also pretty high yield. I'll post the audio to this channel in a couple of days. Our 2019 Step 1 Study Smarter series will launch at the end of March, and gosh, I hope the Step 2 one we keep talking about like forever uh, will be able to start releasing in two weeks. It's just been a bunch of audio editing problems, myself, computer and recording problems, and just a bunch of headaches, I guess, all around. Not that you want to hear me complain, but hey, we tell you what we're going to do, and we don't get it out on time. I feel an obligation to you guys for your support. Plus, it it's just frustrating to be trying to create something and have these roadblocks. But so goes life. Take note, we are adding a couple more podcasts to our arsenal over the next couple months. The most recent one is the Medical Nemesis podcast. So if you click the Inside the Boards provider page or type Inside the Boards into your favorite podcatcher, you should see the Medical Nemonist, which is hosted by ITB's own Dr. Chase DeMarco. It's focused on accelerated learning techniques, memory hacks, and related things to kind of help you get the information you need to recall permanently encoded into your memory. I will remind listeners that you can email us at info at Inside the Boards. Uh, we are looking for people to fill the role of kind of a podcast producer. We've had a few applicants already, plus ITB has a bunch of other needs for which we would love your help if you want to get involved. We have a 36-year-old man who comes to the clinic because of painful swelling and redness in his left arm. Yesterday afternoon, he received a tetanus booster injection in that area. The skin appears indurated, edematous, and dusky. His vital signs are normal. By the next morning, the lesion has subsided slightly. Which of the following is the most likely diagnosis? Is it A, an Arthus reaction? B, a pathogy lesion? C, delayed hypersensitivity? Or D, serum sickness? I got this one. Answer's A, an Arthus reaction. Awesome. So... Why would you have an Arthus reaction, Patrick? Well, an Arthus reaction is a local type 3 hypersensitivity reaction. Um, so you have immunoglobulin IgG antigen complexes that deposit um, into a local site and activate the complement cascade, uh, which results in localized swelling and uh, necrosis. And actually, I've never seen an Arthus reaction except in textbooks and specifically, I think, second year related to studying immunology. <laughs> <laughs> but I, this I is mean... the situation you see in the vignettes. Somebody gets some sort of like booster shot vaccine and then they present with this like painful, edematous, darkly colored and indurated uh, local reaction at the site of the injection. And that is exactly what you'll see with an Arthus reaction. Right. So simple question. Why is there an antigen antibody complex at the injection site? Well, it's a hypersensitivity reaction. So the most basic uh, kind of thing is you have a previous exposure to the antigen, right? Right. So you already have antibodies made and right. then you went and injected the antigen into the arm, right? Yep. So now the antibodies that you've already made are having this reaction with this booster vaccine. 
And and I would I would imagine it's like a spectrum a bit. So like you talk about there being like this complement reaction in the arm, but you know this might lead to necrosis being like the worst outcome. But on like a if you put it on a scale, it may be just simple skin swelling. It, it may be the kind of thing you experience when you have like uh, an injection site pain. You know. Yeah, yeah, and that's I guess probably more likely the dude gets a tetanus booster in his past and then, or a tetanus shot in his past, he forms the antibodies, gets another tetanus booster, reacts to it with uh, those preformed antibodies, which complex with the antigen that's being presently given, causing the local symptoms we see here. And notably, the tetanus, diphtheria, and hepatitis B vaccines are more likely to result in an Arthas type picture. Right. And like, you know that when you've got it, Probably in the past, you've had a tetanus shot and you're like, those shots hurt. The main thing that I would want that's important to distinguish here is this being a type three lesion ver- or type three hypersensitivity versus a type four hypersensitivity. So this happens within a day or two of having this injection. But if it were to take three or four days, like a PPD reaction, yeah, that would be your type four hypersensitivity, which would be involving the T cells, right? Got it. Yep, exactly. Um, And that was answer C, delayed hypersensitivity, which would indicate more of like a type 4 hypersensitivity reaction, like a drug reaction. My favorite example, poison ivy. Yeah. You're exposed, and then 48 hours, three days later maybe, you get the, the skin findings, the the blistering, the pruritus, the edema, et cetera, et cetera. Pathergy was answer choice uh, B, and that's just an exaggerated skin injury that occurs after minor trauma. Kind of like, I was going to say, it's basically like a pimple. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. Well, what else do we do? Serum sickness? Yeah, and that doesn't really match with anything we're talking about here. So, you know, it's got fever. It is got... a type 3 sensitivity reaction, right? Uh, yeah. But it's a systemic one. So right. instead of just the localized edema, potentially necrosis at the antigen introduction site, uh, you get fever, urticaria, you can have arthralgias and or the nephritis. I think that's all. I think we move on from there. Yeah, let's go. So the next one, a 60 year old man comes to the clinic because of shortness of breath, fever and weight gain over the past week. He received a heart transplant three weeks prior and has had no complications in his post-operative recovery period. He's due for another routine heart biopsy, which he undergoes. The sample is taken to pathology. Which of the following findings is most likely to be described in the pathology report? A, mostly eosinophils with some evidence of complement fragments on staining. B, infiltrating T cells with some eosinophils, plasma cells, and neutrophils, as well as injury to blood vessels and altered tissue architecture. C, complement fragments and macrophages consistent with cell-related rejection. Or D, fibroblasts and myofibroblasts. And the answer here is what? All right, so this is describing an acute reaction um, or acute rejection. And in the case of acute rejection, you're going to have infiltrates with T cells, neutrophils, B cells, plasma cells, and eosinophils. So B is going to be your answer. Okay, cool. And you are correct. Um, I mean, you hit the nail on the head. So an acute heart transplant rejection uh, can occur as early as one week after surgery. Um, and it's, uh, the reaction is driven by cell mediated immune mechanisms, but graft rejection or organ rejection, whether it's acute, subacute or chronic, you diagnose that based on the clinical information, right? So the clinical information in this vignette, it's got some shortness of breath, fever, and weight gain, and the laboratory information, which is part of the answer choice, infiltrating T cells with some eosinophils, plasma cells, and neutrophils, as well as injury to blood vessels and altered tissue architecture. The tissue biopsy component is 
key for the diagnosis and that evidence of tissue destruction and a T lymphocyte infiltrate is prominent. What else to say about this? I guess highly vascular organs are more likely to experience acute rejection and to experience it more quickly. We could draw a distinction between acute and hyperacute rejection. Nah, so, that's probably too much. <laughs> I, I mean, okay, so let's be honest here. Uh, we didn't go over the different types of hypersensitivities. I, I don't really want to get into the different kinds of rejection because let's be honest, you guys need to go look at that in a book if you haven't picked up on how those different things occur. The important thing, I, I guess let's highlight the time course, maybe. Okay, so let's make it simple. Acute, you're talking something on the order of weeks. Chronic rejection, you're looking on the order of months to years. And if this patient had a chronic graft rejection, you would see fibrosis of the vasculature, and you'd probably see evidence of fibrotic tissue deposit around the vessels and stenosis of the arterioles and vasculature supplying the organ. And if I remember correctly from my Robins, instead of seeing something like neutrophils, you'd more likely see uh, another different prominent cell type. Mm, so macrophages and fibroblasts? Or... Exactly. So in simple terms, I always think of like acute pathology infiltrates, neutrophils, chronic pathology-related findings uh, in general, lymphocytes. Actually, I guess that's probably not that helpful. <laughs> <laughs> well, you're thinking of acute versus chronic inflammation. You want to think more about chronic rejection being like a fibrotic uh, situation where you've got fibrosis over time. Acute is more of your, you know, like chronic inflammation with lymphocytes and macrophages. And hyperacute would be like complement antibody mediated. You unclamp the artery and immediately start to see uh, damage generation and damage to the organ, right? Yeah. And that makes sense, right? The uh, innate immune system is more immediate. And let's, we can probably move on from there. All right. A three-year-old comes to the office because of dyspnea, severe cough, and a fever of four days. Examination shows tachypnea and bibasilar crackles on pulmonary auscultation. Chest x-ray and laboratory tests confirm the diagnosis of pneumocystis gyrovecchi pneumonia. Further lab tests show abnormalities of low IgG, IgG <laughs> IgG, IgA, and IgE immunoglobulins. However, levels of IgM are far above normal. Which of the following cell surface markers is most likely defective? Is it A, CD40 ligand, B, CD86, C, FAS ligand, or D, T cell receptors? Uh, this one I would have guessed on if I were taking my step one exam right now. The answer is the CD40 ligand, but why? Okay, so this is like, according to Pathoma and Sketchy and First Aid, this is like a, a favorite of the boards because it gives you this little immunology tie-in with the pathology. CD40 and CD40 ligand are going to be the uh, main connection that stimulates between CD4 positive T cells and B cells to now allow for class switching. So if you have a defect in either CD40 receptor or the ligand, ligand, you know, you're not going to be able to have class switching within the B cell. So you're stuck with IgM and an inability to switch to IgG. Right. Or any other immunoglobulin. So this patient has what you would call hyper IgM syndrome? Yes, yeah. And it's uh, characterized by severe pyogenic infections. They start at a very young age. And this one really kind of gives it away with the PJP pneumonia. But, you know, the boards really like this one because, or, or at least you will find this in any question bank, 
because it's highlighting that you need the CD40, CD40 ligand interaction in order to have class switching. All right, next. A 16-year-old female is brought to the emergency department following a motor vehicle accident. Her past medical history is significant for multiple episodes of recurrent diarrhea and frequent sinus infections as a child. On examination, she is afebrile. Her heart rate is 125 beats per minute. Respirations are 25 per minute. And her blood pressure is 90 over 40. Her extremities are cool and her conjunctiva appear pale. Serum laboratory analysis shows a hemoglobin of 9.0 grams per deciliter, a white blood cell count of 4,000, platelets of 90,000. She is transfused with several units of whole blood, and within a few minutes of initiating the transfusion, she develops dyspnea and her blood pressure drops further. She is given epinephrine and is aggressively resuscitated with intravenous fluids. For which of the following conditions is this patient at most increased risk? A. Lymphoma. B. Peripheral neuropathy. C. Endocarditis. Or D. Ulcerative colitis. Um, Okay, so this patient had a blood transfusion and went into anaphylaxis. Yep. The most likely cause of that is going to be um, selective IgA deficiency. When you take into consideration her childhood history of recurrent GI problems and respiratory tract problems, right? In addition to that, this is asking you what is she at increased risk for. So people with a selective IgA deficiency are at increased risk for autoimmune disorders. Uh, So that's going to lead you to answer choice D, ulcerative colitis. And that is correct. So this is an important one especially in terms of the structure of vignettes and how you see this material presented in the review books and whatnot, namely that people with selective IgA deficiency, what do you have to know? Number one, childhood history or long-term history of recurrent gastrointestinal infections, gastroenteritis, and respiratory infections, you know, sinus problems, pneumonia, things of that nature. Next, these patients are notable for being prone to anaphylaxis when uh, given blood transfusions. And the reason for this is that with a selective IgA deficiency, because remember the IgA immunoglobulin is the mucosal immunoglobulin. So it's handling potential threats within the GI or respiratory tract. But with selective IgA deficiency, the IgA antibodies contained in the whole blood lead to an anaphylactic sort of reaction. Right. So let me uh, elaborate on that Yeah. just a second, because what's going to happen is if they have IgA deficiency, they're going to develop anti-IgA antibodies naturally. You know, it's kind of like the uh, ABO incompatibility. Yes. So you're going to have circulating anti-IgA. When you administer whole blood, which has immunoglobulin in it, you're going to receive that IgA, and it's going to cause this reaction to occur. Got it. I vaguely remember all of that. (laughs) (laughs) What else? Anything else about selective IgA deficiency? So it's more common in African American population. Uh, the you know one of the big tie-ins with microbiology is they they along with other immunodeficiencies like or primary immunodeficiencies like this are at increased risk for uh, Giardia infections. Hmm. So this could easily have been presented with like what you know what's causing her diarrhea kind of question. Yeah, since IgA is important in protecting the GI tract from that parasite. Right, exactly. And if it's missing, then, well, you're more prone to those infections as long as along with the other mucosal infections. One of the things that isn't really well described, you know, elucidated to me, and if someone knows, like, feel free to let me know. Crowdsourcing your uh, step one preparation? Yeah, exactly. So when these children are breastfed, reasonably, they're receiving IgA from mom. Right. So why don't these kind of reactions occur then? I guess it's not getting to the serum. Okay, so that probably answers my question. Never mind. (laughs) Yeah, see, there you go. 
thinking clinically. That's that's why you do four years in med school. Yeah, that that makes sense. But but if that is not actually correct, reach out to us. Let us know. Yeah, exactly. I'm just kind of piecing those together. So the important part that this question's highlighting is just that patients with selective IgA deficiency are at increased risk for other autoimmune diseases. They've used ulcerative colitis. I think in the past, like the stereotypical one for these kind of questions is celiac disease. But, you know, uh, any yeah. of the autoimmune deficiencies could be a possibility. Sure. So autoimmune diseases like UC or lupus, rheumatoid arthritis, eczema. Want to move on? Yep. An eight-month-old infant comes to the clinic because of recurrent bacterial infections. A complete blood count was conducted at every past visit and each time revealed an absolute leukocyte count of 3,000 cells, with 10% being segmented neutrophils. He has hypopigmented skin and sparse whitish hair. A peripheral blood smear shows neutrophils with enlarged abnormal granules. Which of the following is the most likely diagnosis? A. Aplastic anemia. B. Barth syndrome. C. Chediac Higashi syndrome. Or D. Vitamin B12 deficiency. I know this one, actually, at least I would have guessed this one solely from the note in the vignette that the kid has hypopigmented skin and sparse whitish hair. So they're trying to tell you that he has albinism and albinism is associated with Ancestroy C, Chediac Higashi syndrome. Perfect. Chediac Higashi is an autosomal recessive disorder, can lead to immunocompromised primary immunodeficiency. And I think one of the key features is these abnormally large granules in leukocytes. Yes. So the the interesting thing, too, about this question is that all the answer choices can present with the finding that you see in the vignette of low white blood cell count, specifically neutropenia. But the that identifying factor, those giant uh, azurophilic granules in the leukocytes and platelets is a key feature of Chedakigashi syndrome, as well as those findings of albinism and uh, recurrent pyogenic infections. So <laughs> one of the nice things about it is it's due to the uh, CHS gene, which is nice because it, it actually makes sense, right? Yeah. Yeah. Well, that <laughs> that's nice. Um yeah, that uh, works out if you're asked, uh, where's the mutation most likely to occur? Right. So I'm guessing they're probably not going to ask that question because it's so straightforward. No. <laughs> yeah, probably not, unfortunately. But those are the highlights. Albinism, recurrent pyogenic infections, azerophilic granules in leukocytes and platelets, Cheta Kigashi. What about the other ones? Apl aplastic anemia. Why isn't it that? Mm, don't you have a pancytopenia? Exactly. That's how I rule. I would rule that one out. So they only told me the leukocytes were low. They didn't tell me that the platelets were low and that the patient has a significant anemia. So if he had aplastic anemia, all three cell lines would be decreased. So nope, not that one. Next answer choice was Barth syndrome. I don't know that I know this one that well. I don't either. So I don't think... We should spend too much time on it. If I've if I've encountered it, it was just a line in a, a slide of medical school lecture. <laughs> Perfect. There's your learning point. If something is so increasingly rare that it only deserves one single line in a lecture or a review book, and you don't have the brain space to fit that in along with other more common or more commonly tested items like aplastic anemia or Chedakagashi, just skip it. So that's what we're going to do. Vitamin <laughs> B, <laughs> the last uh, distractor is vitamin B12 deficiency. Why isn't it this one? No, so you're going to have like a, uh, a macrocytic anemia in that, so in that case, which would have a predisposition to hypersegmented neutrophils, not these large granules in the neutrophils. Exactly. And more commonly, you see vitamin B12 deficiency in older patients. I guess the important thing to remember for vitamin B12 deficiency, which probably comes up so commonly that everyone knows this, but just in case, you can see hypersegmented neutrophilia with either folic acid, folate deficiency, 
or vitamin B12 deficiency. You see the macrocytic anemia as a shared feature of both as well. However, the important thing that you have to keep in mind is that vitamin B12 deficiency can lead to peripheral neuropathy. Peripheral Sorry. neuropathy, yes, <laughs> that is true. <laughs> But uh, I was thinking about subacute combined degeneration of the spinal cord, right? Which that's the, you know, they have uh, some sort of macrocytic anemia. Uh, so their MCV is over 100 hypersegmented neutrophils on a blood smear. Then the physician in the vignette gives them uh, folic acid and they don't address the vitamin B12 deficiency. So the patient progresses to neurologic symptoms subsequently with the worst uh, thing being this subacute combined degeneration of the spinal cord that leads to like gait abnormalities. That is why you don't just give somebody folic acid supplementation if they have a macrocytic anemia. You need to determine whether or not it is a vitamin B12 deficiency problem or folate problem uh, before uh, initiating treatment just for right. folic acid deficiency. So don't forget that one. And in real life, you just treat with both. But on board questions, it's got to be they treat with one and that means the other one was what's missing. <laughs> so I wanted to make one point about this question that, you know, I Maybe let's wait for this ambulance. I mean, it's it adds to, you know, it's a medical podcast. So it's like, <laughs> you know, like real life, got the ambulance in the background. But no, go ahead. All right. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So uh, Chediak Higashi syndrome is an autosomal recessive defect, right? The I, I'm just going to extrapolate from that and use this question as a moment to give one of these heuristics because we've been doing this for the past two or three episodes where we've talked a heuristic again it is a heuristic it is not an absolute but it can help you a little bit i imagine is that when you're dealing with genetic disorders an autosomal dominant trait typically allows for the patient to grow older or old enough to reproduce it's generally associ associated with something that maybe gets worse once they become adults right if it were not something that allowed them to get become adults, they probably wouldn't get old enough to reproduce and spread that trait to seceding generations. Which is why famous autosomal dominant diseases like Huntington's or von Hippel-Lindau, Marfan's, tuberous sclerosis, hereditary spherocytosis, acute intermittent porphyria, vignettes are going to present a patient who is an adult. Right. And then on the flip side of that, these autosomal recessive disorders are going to be something with increased severity, probably more threatening to the livelihood of the patient. They're rarer. Or their life. Yeah, they're, they're going to you know, likely not allow for them to have a or have much longevity. And because of that, they're rarer and they're not spread from generation to generation. They're more likely to occur in like, you know, this person's parents cousin's child also had the disease or something like that. In general, the, the heuristic, I guess, is autosomal dominant onset in adulthood, autosomal recessive onset in childhood. Not absolute, right. but it can help you maybe. All right. That's it for immunology. Thanks for your support. Hit subscribe, leave a rating, leave a review of our podcast. It does help us continue to grow. And of course, please, please tell your friends. We totally appreciate it.